All right, uh, let's start the chapter four homework review. So this assignment uh, covers a lot of topics as, as uh, we saw in chapter four. There's, um, you know, VSCPR, which is the shape of molecules, and then there's um, a lot of topics about bonding, mainly uh, hybridization and molecular orbital theory. So it seems like a lot of potentially disconnected things, but the real theme is structure and bonding in covalent compounds. And this is going to be, again, sort of the last chapter that's purely conceptual for a while before we start moving into the more quantitative and numerical uh, aspects of the course. The average this week was 9.95 out of 10, so we're kind of staying in that 10 out of 12 range, which um, is perfectly fine. Remember, the, the points on homework assignments don't matter all that much to your grade. The important thing is that you're learning from them and doing them as, as, as practice, as we've talked about many times. All right, so let's get right into it. There were a few questions on um, you know, molecular structure, VSCPR. Um, one thing to be aware of is if we say molecular structure, remember that we're talking about um, just the structure that the atoms themselves make up. So molecular structure ignores the lone pair. If we ask you about, um, or lone pairs, how many there are, if we ask you about electron group arrangement, um, in that case, you have to consider where the lone pairs are arranged as well, and that's going to have fewer possibilities, but the molecular structure is determined um, also by how many lone pairs on the central atom you have. So the first one is the molecular structure of chlorine dioxide, ClO2. Um, so to do all of this, you do need a Lewis structure. So a lot of the things that we're going to talk about in today's review requires a Lewis structure to start. Um, I'm not going to go through all the Lewis structures in a lot of detail, um, but just to review the process for one of them. And this one is a little bit weird, as we'll see, because it does have an odd number of electrons if you haven't dealt with before in Lewis structures. We're still going to follow the same approach. We're going to count electrons first. So we have chlorine and oxygen. As we likely know by now from how many of these we've done, chlorine is a group 7 element, so it's going to contribute 7 valence electrons. Each oxygen from group 6 will contribute 6. So again, we use the group number on the periodic table to count electrons, and so there's going to be 7 from chlorine, and then from oxygen there's going to be 2 times 6, which is 12. So as we said, this is going to have 19 electrons, an odd number. So that may have caused a little bit of confusion at first. Odd number um, species are not always straightforward to deal with in Lewis structures, but we're still going to go forward with the process and, and see what happens with it. So the process is still going to be exactly the same. We start with our center atom, which in this case is going to be chlorine. We do single bonds to each oxygen, and then we complete their octets first. All right, so at this, at this point, we've used um, 16 of our electrons, two octets for each oxygen atom. So that's 16. That means we have three left. And just like before, the three are going to go, whatever, whatever leftover electrons we have are going to go on the central atom. Um, and you can't pair them up all this time, so we're going to pair up two of them, and then the third one's going to be by itself. So again, it looks a little bit weird to have a single electron, but if you have odd electrons, you have no choice but to do that. So that's chlorine dioxide. Um, now there's a debate, of course, of whether we need a double, a double bond in there because our central atom right now has two, four, six, seven electrons, so it's short of an octet. So you probably want to draw at least one double bond in there um, to make it have you know, more than eight electrons. These, these are the debates that come up with odd electron structures that are not easy to resolve. And then you could, of course, draw resonance structures for that. Um, and possibly a second double bond if you want to minimize formal charge. So there's all these things you can do to, you know, change the structure um, and refine it. But really the nice thing is for determining the molecular structure, none of those matter. So, you know, we can draw these two resonance structures or we can alternatively draw it with two double bonds, which I guess would technically still be kind of a resonance structure. In this case, you have no formal charges, but you have to still, again, expand the octet on your central atom, which is fine. So there's a few different ways of drawing this, and as I said, with odd number of electrons and without specifying whether we want you to minimize formal charge, you don't know the best way to draw it, but you don't need to because for determining the molecular structure, all that matters is how many electron groups are bonded to the central atom. It doesn't matter whether those electron groups are singly, doubly bonded, or some combination. It just matters how many there are. So if we sort of translate this to the AXE notation, where A is the central atom chlorine, the chlorine is bonded to two other 
atoms, so that's going to be AX2. And then we also see that it's going to have one, two, three other electrons. Now, how do we count those? Because remember, for the, for the electron pairs, we normally count them as a pair, so there's not really two full pairs, there's one and a half pairs. We have to count this still as AX2E2 um, because we can only put one pair of electrons into a single electron group. Remember, this is based on, on orbitals. You can only put two electrons in orbital. So those two electrons are going to be one electron group together, and then that third odd electron is going to have to count as a separate electron group because it cannot go into the same orbital as the first two. So this would be an AX2E2 structure, which makes it a bent geometry. And that's not any of these answer choices, so that would be none of these. Now you have to recall too that, you know, there's sometimes some shortcuts that can help you answer these questions quickly. Because you, you know, you've probably gone through some of these, and for some of these problems, like, oh, I have to draw a lot of loose structures, and I have to get it correct, and, you know, it's, it takes a lot of time, and, and especially in a, some of the future problems where we have multiple structures to consider in the same problem. So look for things that can reduce your workload, that can, sh that can help you solve the problem a lot faster. And one thing we should remember all the time is that, you know, just looking at the chemical formula without going through all the Lewis structure stuff that we just did, which is still good to do, but you don't have to in this problem because ClO2 is going to be AX2. There's two things on the central atom. We already know that from the formula. And then however many electron pairs we have, we don't, we don't know at that point. But if it's AX2, E, whatever, remember the only two possibilities are linear or bent for a molecular structure. Okay, so if you have an AX2 structure with however many lone pairs it ends up having, the only possibilities are linear or bent, and that's none of the answer choices. So in reality, we could have answered this question without even drawing the Lewis structure because linear and bent is not any of the choices. Um, but to distinguish linear from bent, we would have to go through the process that I did, which is drawing the whole thing out figuring out the number of lone pairs, and so on. So that's a couple of different ways of looking at that problem, but either way you'll get none of these as the correct answer. The next question deals with bond angles. So we want to know the bond angle in H2SE. Um, so again, we have to draw a Lewis structure, which I'm not going to do in great detail, but um, H2SE is going to look like this. It's going to complete the octet on all the atoms, except for, well, not for hydrogen, because it just has a single bond, but the central atom is going to have an octet and it's going to look like that. So a pretty simple structure, almost exactly like water, just with selenium instead of oxygen at the center. And so this structure is AX2E2. Now remember for determining bond angles, we have to consider the electron group arrangement. Um, so the molecular geometry of this would also be bent. It's the same AXE notation as before. But with bent structures to know the bond angles, you have to also consider which electron group arrangement it derives from. So if we have, in this case, a total of four electron groups, X2, E2, that's going to belong to the tetrahedral electron group arrangement. And remember that the magic angle in tetrahedral, which is not obvious, but you need to remember it, is 109.5 degrees. So that's not exactly what it says 109.5, but choice D, 109, is closest. So if you have a bent structure, your, your options for bond angles, there's actually a few of them. Um, namely 120, 109.5, but for it to be AX2E2 with four electron groups, the bond angle is going to be close to 109 degrees. Um, and so again, you need to also think about electron group arrangement for this one to be able to answer which of those bent structures you know, it is and which bond angle then is going to most closely approximate the, the real value. Okay, so that's going to be how we would handle that one. It's, it's just a you know, little extension on what we did in the previous one after determining the molecular structure. Now the next thing we can do with molecular structure, sort of the next prediction we can make about molecules besides bond angles, is going to be whether they have a dipole moment or not. Um, so if, if something has a dipole moment, here we're looking for which of the following molecules has a dipole moment, um, and this one is going to be another way of saying which of the model following molecules is polar. All right, so those are two different ways of asking the same question. So if it's polar, it has a dipole moment. If it's nonpolar, it does not. And we talked in class about how we can classify the different structure types, again, based on their AXE notation, and for polarity in particular, how many electrons, how many uh, lone pair electrons the central atom has is particularly important. And by doing that, you can predict polarity. Um, 
So the first thing that you want to look at in problems like these are, you know, obvious nonpolar molecules where you don't even have to draw the structure. And the ones that are going to be obvious nonpolar molecules are going to be what we call polyatomic elements where you just have the same element bonded to itself, especially the diatomic, which is, you know, so that's going to be things like H2, N2, P4, S8. Some of those we'll encounter in more detail later in the course and why they exist like this. But nonetheless, if you see an element, it's polyatomic that has, means it has more than one atom in the structure, but it's the same element bonded to itself. Those are going to be obviously nonpolar. You don't need to draw their structure or think about them any further. Because in order for a molecule to be polar, to have a dipole moment, it needs to have polar bonds. None of these have polar bonds. So if we're looking for the polar one, we can eliminate choice D right away. O2, oxygen just bonded to itself, cannot be polar because there's no dipole moment in that bond. But the rest of these we need to draw out Lewis structures and consider them. So for BH3, what we would get for the structure, and again, now I'm going to sort of skip a lot of steps and just go through it quickly. BH3 is going to be an AX3 E0 structure, and as we said in class, all the structures that have no lone pairs on the central atom are going to be nonpolar, particularly when all three outer atoms are the same. So this one would be nonpolar because there's no lone pairs on the central atom. For SIF4, what we would end up with, I'll draw the three-dimensional structure here, but um, even if you just drew it in flat notation and looked at what, it, what you end up with, um, there's a bunch of lone pairs too, and so I should draw them in for completeness. But we don't really care about the lone pairs in the outer atom, we only care about the central atom, which is AX4E0 in this case. And again, all the structures that are end in E0 are going to be nonpolar structures when you only have one type of outer atom. So that just leaves choice C, because those two are both nonpolar when they have no lone pairs on the central atom. And so for SF4, what we get is going to be. And I won't draw the lone pairs in the outer atoms, but they are there. But just for looking at the structure, SF4, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6 is going to be AX4E1. And for all the structures that are E1 that have a single lone pair in the central atom, they will be polar, no matter what the combination of central and outer atoms is. So all structures with a single lone pair are polar, so this would be the one that is polar out of these choices. Okay, so it's um, you know helpful to think about the, the geometry and, and sort of understanding why the dipole moments do or do not cancel out, but again, looking at the AXE notation as we talked about in class, you can make some pretty simple predictions about polarity based on primarily how many lone pairs are in the central atom. So again, zero lone pairs in the central atom, that should cue you in that it's a nonpolar structure if all the outer atoms X are the same. If there's one lone pair in the central atom, it's definitely going to be polar. And then the ones that have two lone pairs are on the central atom, there's you know a few different possibilities, which we won't go through now, but you'll have to um, review that in the notes if, if that comes up. All right, and then this is a very similar question, almost identical, just a different set of molecules. So let's go through it again. So we know which of the following molecules has a dipole moment. Um, in this case, there's no obvious nonpolar molecules. Again, we're looking for the one that is polar if it has a dipole moment. Um, and there's no obvious ones here. We don't have any elements in these answer choices. These are all compounds. So we need to go through and draw all of them. And so for CH4, I won't draw the full three-dimensional structure this time, but if you draw the Lewis structure for CH4 and classify it, it's going to be AX4E0. And again, the ones that, have, that end in E0 that have no lone pairs in the central atom are going to be nonpolar, so we can cross that one out. CCL4 is the same, AX4E0. Um, and so that's going to be nonpolar as well, same electron group arrangement, just different outer atoms. And then CO2 is one of the first ones we did in class when we talked about polarity is AX2E0. And that's going to be nonpolar as well because there's no lone pairs in the central atom. So we get rid of those three pretty quickly. Now we have to decide if SO2 is or is not polar. Um, so SO2 would have 18 valence electrons and the structure you would get should look something like this. Um, 
whether you draw two double bombs or one. Again, there's a you know question of whether you want to follow the octet rule or not. Um, but you would get either way one lone pair in the center atom. AX2E1 or just AX2E. And as we said, any structure that has one lone pair in the center atom will definitely be polar. So that's going to be our answer choice here. So really a, a very similar question as the last one. Now there is a bit of a shortcut you can also take on this one and end problems like it. So we remember we talked about, you know, the some of the, and this is going to come up later on in this review too, the patterns for, you know, different um, P block elements, especially those two P elements, carbon, oxygen, nitrogen, those ones, and how many, you know, bonds and lone pairs they tend to have. And so with carbon in almost every structure, again, there's a couple of exceptions to this, but really um, for, for carbon, I'll write it out as carbon here, you're typically going to have, you know, four bonds and zero lone pairs. The only exception I can think of off the top of my head, that's a neutral molecule, and an ion is going to be a CO, carbon monoxide, which is a triple bond. But in typical structures that involve carbon as a central atom, four bonds, zero lone pairs. And as we said, any structure that has zero lone pairs is going to be nonpolar as long as all the outer atoms are the same. So if you look at A, B, and C, they have carbon at the center. They all have just one type of atom bonded to carbon, CH4, CCl4, CO2. So those ones we could eliminate as being nonpolar without even going through all the effort of drawing the structure and classifying them. Because again, carbon in just about every structure except for carbon monoxide being the, the no most notable exception, carbon would have zero lone pairs. And any structure that has zero lone pairs will be nonpolar as long as there's only one type of atom that it's bonded to. So we could have done those ones a little bit quicker because with carbon at the center, it's very rare for it to be polar unless there's two different atoms that carbon is bonded to. So we can save some time that way as well. All right, the next couple questions I'm going to go over deal with hybridization. Um, so we'll start with a reasonably simple one, which is O3. Um, and again, with a little bit of game theory in mind. So O3, we're going to have a central atom that's oxygen. And remember that oxygen is one of these 2p elements. It's before, you know, atomic number 10. And so for those elements, especially, you know, the, the four in this row, boron, carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, fluorine, remember that we can only have a maximum of eight electrons. So with oxygen at the central atom, or any of these forms, boron, carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, fluorine, if those are in your structure and you're asked about hybridization, these ones can have, remember, no more than eight valence electrons around them. And that means the only possible hybridizations are going to be sp, sp2, or sp3. In order to go to dsp3 or d2sp3, you have to expand the octet. We never do that for these elements, including oxygen. And so you cannot have dsp3 or d2sp3 hybridizations. So we can eliminate d and e right off the bat. And I don't think any of you picked those, or very few of you picked those as the answer anyway. So you, you sort of picked up on that yourselves. But um, again, save yourself some time give yourself a better chance of getting it right, even if you're not sure, by realizing that for 2p elements, the ones that are before atomic number 10, the ones that cannot expand their octet, these are the only three possible hybridizations, sp, sp2, sp3. But now we have to distinguish between those three to get this question right. So the Lewis structure for O2 is, I'm sorry, O3 in this case, is a little bit weird, um, it's, but if you follow the, the approach that I gave you, what you should get is a Lewis structure like this, and you're going to end up with one lone pair on the central atom. In this case, you cannot draw two double bonds because you can't expand the octet on oxygen. Um, so what you actually end up having is, by necessity, formal charges, plus one and minus one, and then two equivalent resonance structures where you can move the double bond either side. or in this case, it's still plus one in the central atom, and the minus one formal charge would be over there on the left. So O3 is really the only uh, common example of an elemental molecule. O3 just has three oxygen atoms in it, so it is a form of oxygen as an element, but this one's going to actually end up being polar. That's not part of the question here, but as I said in a previous problem, if you have a polyatomic element, in just about every case, it's going to be nonpolar. O2 would be nonpolar, but if you have O3, 
because we have this unequal arrangement of the electrons where the central oxygen atom is different than the other two in, in terms of its formal charge, in terms of how many bonds and lone pairs it has, it's different than the other two. So because of that, the electrons are not symmetrically distributed, even though it's the same atom in all three cases, so it will be polar. But that's not what the question is getting at here. This is just asking for hybridization. And remember that hybridization is determined by how many electron groups you have. So if we did this in AXE notation for the central atom, it's bonded to two other oxygen atoms, so it's AX2, and it has one lone pair, so it's going to be AX2E, or E1 if you want to be more specific. So two outer atoms, one lone pair, means we have three electron groups. And so for having three electron groups attached to our central atom, we need to hybridize three orbitals. So we have an S and three P orbitals available. We need to hybridize three of those. So we take the first three, which is SP2. So the correct answer for this would be SP2 for the hybridization on the central oxygen atom, where again, you have two atoms bonded to it and one lone pair. Three electron groups requires SP2 hybridization. Remember for hybridization, just like the structure, we don't really care whether the atoms are singly or doubly bonded. It just counts as a single electron group and then that's how we get the hybridization, is just based on that number there. All right, so that's hybridization of a relatively simple one. And then this question takes it a step further and asks for which has sp3d hybridization and no dipole moment. Um, so we're looking for two things here. We're looking for the one that has this hybridization. Um, and in some sense, we're working a little bit backwards here. We're asking you for the hybridization, so sp3d means five electron groups, or a steric number of five, using the terminology I gave in class. Um, and then no dipole moment, again, means nonpolar. So we're looking for two things with these molecules here. Now there is one that we can eliminate because, as we said, these few 2p elements that are commonly found as central atoms, especially the first four, boron, carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, um, fluorine is not usually at the center, but it can be, those ones are not, not going to have sp3d hybridization. They can only go as high as sp3. So we can eliminate choice B without having to consider it further. But the rest of these, the central atom, phosphorus, sulfur, bromine, phosphorus, again, those are all beyond atomic number 10. So sp3d hybridization is a possibility for them. They don't have to have sp3d hybridization, but they can. So let's go through these. And again, we're going to do this quickly and just write out the Lewis structures without considering them. So for choice A, PCL3, what we're going to have is a Lewis, stru Lewis structure that has a single lone pair in the central atom. I mean, I'm going to have to draw the structure that's not going to give us really any useful information. So let's just write it out. So for PCL3, what you would get, it's AX3, and then when you draw the Lewis structure, you get one lone pair on the central atom, E or E1. So this is going to be four electron groups. Three plus one is four, and that makes the hybridization sp3. We have to hybridize four orbitals. So that's not the correct hybridization. It's also polar, by the way, but so really for, no, for neither of those can we choose choice A. If we go, we, we eliminated choice B because it cannot be sp3 dehybridized. And then for C, D, and E, if we have SF4, we think we saw this one a little bit earlier. This is a pretty common structure we'll ask you about. This one is AX4 E1, five electron groups. So that does make it sp3d or dsp3, you can write that in either way, because there's five groups. As we said, you need five electron groups to have sp3d hybridization, hybridizing five orbitals. Um, so that's the correct hybridization, but this one has a single lone pair on the central atom, so this one's going to be polar. All right, anything with one lone pair on the central atom is polar. We're looking for the one that's non-polar as well, so we eliminate choice C. Correct hybridization, but it's polar. For choice D, BRF3, again, I'm skipping the Lewis structure, but you should draw it out yourself to convince yourself that, um, you know, that this is correct. You do need to be able to do Lewis structure as quickly, because on this problem, there's not really an obvious shortcut except for choice B, as we talked about, so you're going to have to draw the rest of the structures. BRF3 is going to end up as AX3E2. Make sure I get that right. So this also has five electron groups, which means it's the correct hybridization. 
But we need to think about if this structure is polar or nonpolar. And with two lone pairs in the central atom, it's not, as I said, an obvious choice whether it's polar or nonpolar. You need to think about the structure in a little bit more detail or alternatively memorize the whole table that I gave you. But for BRF3, what we get for the structure is going to be T-shaped. So we'll have lone pairs on two of those trigonal positions, and then we'll have fluorines on the other two. And as we said, in a T-shaped structure, these two dipoles more or less cancel each other out because they're opposite each other. But then you have a dipole, in this case, written left to right towards this fluorine, which is not going to be canceled out by anything on the other side because the other side just has lone pairs. So you have a net dipole in any T-shaped molecule pointing towards the, the side, if you're drawing it in this orientation, um, towards the one that doesn't have another atom opposite to it. So in a T-shaped structure, you're going to get a dipole moment. So this one is also polar. As I said, for two lone pairs, you, there's not really one classification. It's polar or nonpolar, depending on which of those structures it actually is. But for AX3, E2, those would all be polar structures. So that one is out. So that means PCL5 better be the right one, so you've eliminated the, left, the rest. PCL5 is AX5. So that's five electron groups as well. AX5E0, if we want to be more complete. There's no lone pairs on the central atom in this case. So that will be sp3d with five electron groups. And because there's no lone pairs on the central atom, as we said in previous problems, that makes the whole structure nonpolar when all the outer atoms are the same. So this is our correct answer. It has the correct hybridization and is nonpolar. Two of those other choices had the correct hybridization but were polar. Um, and it's the only one that's nonpolar and sp3d is pcl5. So there's a couple of ways you could have approached that problem. It depends on if you're more comfortable determining hybridization or determining polarity. You could, you know, determine the polarity first and then figure out, you know, of the ones that are nonpolar, which one is sp3d, or as I did here, you could determine the hybridization and then figure out if it's polar second. I mean, it really doesn't matter what order you determine those in, um, but you need to figure out both of those for this problem here. So it combines two of the previous concepts. So the next two problems are going to deal with this structure here, which is called tetracyanoethylene, and we gave you the skeleton structure. So remember, the skeleton structure just shows single bonds between all the atoms. It leaves out any multiple bonds that you might have, and it also leaves out the lone pairs. Um, and so we need to fill that in to be able to answer the questions here. Um, and so to do this, what we need to look at, again, is some patterns that come out of this. So there, these types of organic structures are going to have very often you know, these elements in them, I guess I should include hydrogen as well, um, even though as we said, hydrogen is a very simple one. And then sometimes you'll have halogens where that's going to be, again, fluorine, fluorine, etc. So you have these possible atoms in a lot of these structures, um, these organic molecules, and 99% of the time this is the pattern they're going to follow. Hydrogen, of course, only has one bond, nothing else. The rest of these want to have a complete octet, and they do that in different ways. So carbon will tend to have four bonds and zero lone pairs. Nitrogen will have three bonds and one lone pair to get its octet. Oxygen will have two of each. And then halogens, if they're in the structure, will have just one bond and three lone pairs. So they all get eight total valence electrons, but they do that with different combinations of bonds and lone pairs. And again, the reason they do that is because that's how you minimize formal charge. Um, so for these structures, we need to fill this in by following these patterns. We could try to count all the valence electrons and, you know, arrange them out, but it's, it's kind of a hassle when you have this many atoms in your structure and no real clearly defined central atom. So we're going to follow these patterns to do it. So each one should have, um, you know, these sort of patterns. And what I like to do for these ones is sort of start on the outside and work your way in. Because um, the ones on the outside have fewer possibilities because they're they're bonded to fewer things. So if we look at these nitrogen atoms here that are on the outside, they want to have three bonds and one lone pair, and the only way to do that is to make all of them triply bonded. So that's your three bonds, a triple bond, and then your one lone pair. There's no other way to do it for those nitrogen atoms because they're only bonded to one thing, so it has to be a triple bond. All right. And then we go to the carbon atoms that those are bonded to, and by putting that triple bond in, those carbon atoms already have four bonds. They have the three bonds to nitrogen in the triple bond, plus one bond to the internal carbons, 
And so those carbon atoms we don't do anything to anymore because they've already got their four bonds. And then for the central carbon atoms here, these two in the middle, they right now have three bonds shown, three single bonds to, to different carbon atoms. So they're gonna need one more bond, which we're gonna put in as a double bond. And the only place we can put it that would not mess up the other carbon atoms and give them too many bonds is right here. So if we put a double bond there, then we're gonna have these two carbons also having four bonds, two to each other, plus two more to the outside carbon atoms. If we, put, if we try to put double bonds anywhere else, we're gonna end up with five bonds to one of those carbons. A carbon with five bonds is called a Texas carbon, but it doesn't really exist in real life, so we don't wanna do that. Okay, so those are gonna be, that's gonna be the final structure then. And here we're looking for how many atoms are sp hybridized. Um, and so for sp hybridization, you're, you're again looking for things that have two electron groups. Oops, sorry. So two electron groups for, for which was, and we're going to count both carbon and nitrogen can both be sp hybridized. So we look at the nitrogen atoms. Those ones have one bond, one bonded atom, a triple bond, but one atom bonded to it, one lone pair. So each nitrogen is going to be sp because it's, it's attached to two things. Remember, an electron group is either an atom that's bonded to it or a lone pair. So nitrogen is bonded to one carbon, also has a lone pair, so that's also going to, they're all going to be sp, all the nitrogens are the same. So those four. And then if you look at the carbon atoms that they're bonded to that have triple bonds, each of these carbon atoms is bonded to one nitrogen and one carbon. So it's again bonded to a total of two things, no lone pairs in that case. So this carbon, same thing, nitrogen, carbon, two things. Nitrogen, carbon, bonded to two things, carbon, nitrogen. So all of those carbon atoms that are also triply bonded are sp as well. And then if we wanna finish this off and look at the hybridization of the other two carbon atoms to make sure they're not also sp, these carbon atoms are bonded to three things, carbon, carbon, and then another carbon. So each of these is bonded to three carbons, one, two, three. So if they're bonded to three things, three electron groups, that makes, we need three orbitals to hybridize, sp2 for both of those. So the atoms in the structure are either sp or sp2 hybridized. And so the ones that are sp hybridized, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight of them, choice D. Another way to look at this is if you have a triple bond in a Lewis structure, particularly one that involves you know, carbon, oxygen, nitrogen, all these ones here, that needs to be sp hybridized for that to work. Because for a triple bond, you need two unhybridized p orbitals. So you can only hybridize one of the p orbitals with the s to make it sp. So you look for the ones that are triply bonded. We have, again, four nitrogens and four carbons that all have triple bonds. So that's another way of identifying quickly or sp hybridized atoms. Um, if they have a just, just one double bond, as these ones do, that makes it sp2. Um, so there's... Uh, a couple ways of looking at that one as well. And the next structure deals with the same, or sorry, the next question deals with the same structure, but this time we're looking for how many sigma and pi bonds there are. Um, so for that, we also need to fill out the structure. For getting the number of sigma bonds, you can use the skeleton structure and just look at, you know, how many bonds between atoms without thinking about the um, without thinking about whether they're single, double, or triple, because every every bond, whether it's single, double, or triple, is going to have one sigma bond involved. So if we look at this structure, we count the number of bonds, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. That means there should be nine sigma bonds, all right? Because there's nine total bonds in the molecule. We haven't yet determined if they're single, double, or triple, but whether they're single, double, or triple, each bond is going to involve one sigma bond. So a total of nine of those bonds, that means nine sigma is correct. So we can quickly, if we, if we trust ourselves, we can eliminate a few answer choices. Only the ones with nine sigma bonds are going to be ones that we need to consider. Um, but to get the rest of this, figure out how many pi bonds there are, we do need to go through and finish out the structure like we did before. So as we saw, we get triple bonds there. and all bond there. So looking at the bonds in this structure, we don't care about the lone pairs anymore, but we do care about the bonds. Remember, each bond is going to be, if it's, it's gonna have one sigma bond and the rest, if it's a multiple bond, will be pi. So for these triple bonds here, we have one sigma bond and two pi. 
for each of those triple bonds, one sigma and two pi. All right, for this single bond, we have four single bonds in the structure between these carbons. All single bonds are sigma, so those are gonna be sigma as well. And then our double bond here is gonna be a sigma bond and a pi bond. Remember, anytime you have multiple bonds, it's one sigma, the rest pi. So if we count all the sigmas and pi's, we should get nine sigma, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, just as we found by looking at the skeleton. And then for the pi bonds, we have two, four, six, eight, nine. So two each for the triple bonds, one for the double bond, total of nine. So the correct answer again is choice D. It seems like choice D came up in a lot of these questions. Um, nine sigma, nine pi. So sigma bonds are a little bit more straightforward to count because every bond has one sigma bond. Again, whether it's a single, double, or triple bond, one of those will be sigma. So you just have to count how many connections there are between atoms to figure out how many sigma bonds there are. But for pi bonds, you need to, again, complete the Lewis structure with the correct number of multiple bonds and you know, completing the octet of every atom. And then once you do that, you can figure out how many pi bonds there are in the structure. All right, so that takes us through that one. And then we did pretty well, I would say, on the molecular orbital problems. So there's, you know, several problems on this assignment that dealt with, you know, drawing molecular orbital diagrams, considering the electron configuration, considering the bond order, um, you know, considering how many unpaired electrons there are, stuff like that. We really didn't have any huge problems with that. There was this one problem here, though, that, that um, some of us did not do quite correctly, so let's go through it, which is the bond order of C2+. plus. So at this point in the course, if we ask you for the bond order of a diatomic, either a neutral molecule or an ion as it is in this case, you should immediately think about molecular orbital theory. And again, the key thing for molecular orbital theory is to know the order of the molecular orbitals, which are the center of the diagram if you're drawing the whole thing. So we don't want to draw the whole thing out. You do need to remember that, so carbon is the two P elements that's going to have 2s and 2p valence orbitals, so you're going to always have your sigma and your sigma star 2s. And then there's the 2p level, we have different orderings of that are possible for the bonding orbitals. If we're determining bond order, it doesn't matter if we actually mess up the ordering. But for carbon, remember the pi orbitals come first for 2p and then the sigma. And then we have our bonding orbitals on top that are always in the same order, or anti-bonding orbitals that are always in the same order up top. All right, so this is the correct ordering of the orbitals in carbon. In class, we drew the you know, outside part of the diagram that shows the atomic orbitals that these are derived from. But the important part for any question that deals with molecular orbital theory, where it asks you for a bond order or for an electron configuration, is just to know what order these orbitals fall in. So again, this is the part here that's important to remember in some cases where for carbon and for boron as well, nitrogen, pi comes before sigma, but if you did mess that up here, you wouldn't get the wrong bond order. But what we need to figure out for to get the bond order is how many valence electrons we have. So carbon is group four. So C2 would have two times four valence electrons, which is eight, but it's C2 plus, we have to remove one for the positive charge. So we're gonna have a total of seven valence electrons in this structure. And as we said, if you're drawing Lewis structures with odd number of electrons, it's sometimes hard to do, it's sometimes hard to get the bond orders correct. But with molecular orbital theory, we just need to fill in seven electrons, lowest energy to highest energy um, in that order. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So it's odd number, so it has one unpaired electron, of course, and that unpaired electron is here in the pi 2p. And then to calculate the bond order, we just need to do this simple formula here. So with one half, and then we're going to take the number of electrons that are in bonding orbitals first. Those are orbitals that do not have stars next to them. So we have these two electrons in sigma 2s, and we have one, two, three electrons in pi 2p. So five of our seven electrons are in bonding orbitals, two, four, five. And the other two of our seven electrons would have to be antibonding. That's going to be those two that are in sigma star 2s. So it's going to be one half times five minus two, which is going to be 1.5 or one and a half, as it's written here. All right, so we get a fractional bond order anytime we have an odd number of electrons, and the correct fractional bond order is gonna be D. And again, you could have saved yourself some time here.
because if you have an odd number of electrons, your bond order has to be a fraction, so we could have eliminated A, C, and E before we even started, and then that leaves us with two possible answer choices. So thinking a little bit about some of those patterns, in this case the number of electrons being odd makes the bond order fractional, you can eliminate three of your answer choices and even just by guessing you have a 50% chance of getting it right. But again, once you draw the diagram, you can calculate the bond order very easily and it comes out in this case to 1.5 and that's the answer you would pick. Alright, that takes me to the end of that review. Um, so if you have any uh, other questions on this assignment, please get in touch with me. Um, and then we'll be back next week with, with the first of the two Chapter 5 assignments. Alright, I'll see you guys in class this week and, and have a good rest of your day.